this is Lakeview, California, one of a score of American communities which came into being during and after World War II. This is the Lakeview Research Laboratory of Nuclear Physics, one of the top secret government projects vital to the national defense and security. To be a worker at Lakeview, one must be first an American of proven loyalty. The task of guarding projects like Lakeview is entrusted to the Federal Bureau of Investigation which explains why Special Agent Daniel F. O'Hara, in charge of the Lakeview security detail, remains in his office long after regular hours, night after night. Hi. Oh, what are you doing here this time of night? Trying to win the Legion of Merit? Just refreshing my memory, waiting for a phone call from Jimmy Colton. He's out at Lakeview on a deal. What are you doing here on your time? Rechecking last week's applications for employment at Lakeview. About 300 of them. Oh, hello. Dan, this is Colton. I'm talking from a booth at the Lakeview Arena. I think I've run into something red hot. You mean something connected with Radcheck? Yeah, that's right. Can you get over here right away? 20 minutes. That'll be... Jimmy. Jimmy! Jimmy! Colton! Whoever gave it to him sure got away clean. With all the excitement and yelling inside, nobody even heard the shots. This young lady just happened to pass by the booth and glance inside. It looks funny to her, so she opens the door, lets out a yelp, and faints dead away. He was he was sitting there. I thought he was tight or asleep, and, and then I saw... You didn't see who did it? No, no, I only saw him. Just like that. I phoned in the report the homicide squad should be here any minute. Try to identify him, didn't have anything on him. His name is James Colton. He lived at 110 F Street here in Lakeview. That's about all we can do here. Sergeant, will you? I'll take care of everything. Thanks. I can't understand why anyone would want to kill a fine team. Like all right, folks, that's it. Break it up. Come on, everybody move. Please, break it up. Break it up. You've got other places to go. Come on, what's the matter? Read about it in the paper. Mm -hmm. Sorry to bring you back to the office this time of night, Mr. North, but, well, I wanted your permission to follow this rad check thing through to a finish. I understand how you feel, Dan. Colton was a fine boy. It must be demonstrated to Mr. Radcheck, as it has been to others who have had the same idea, that the murder of an FBI man inevitably leads to very disagreeable consequences. Radcheck. I remember the name, but it was some time ago. About a year ago. An order went out at that time to pick him up on suspicion of illegal entry into the country. Oh, yes. Now I remember. He did a vanishing act before he could be brought in. That's right. And he didn't show again until I spotted him day before yesterday. I'd picked him up then instead of putting Colton on him to find out what he was doing in Lakeview. Jimmy'd still be alive. People die of old age, too, Dan. What could Colton have come up with that forced Ratchek to take such a crazy chance? Commit murder practically in front of a couple of thousand witnesses. I'll remember to ask Radcheck that when I meet him in person. I've got all avenues out of Lakeview covered. Good. By the way, Mr. North, do you remember the... Excuse me. O'Hara. Allison at the Lakeview bus depot. Subject just bought himself a ticket for San Francisco. Good. Hang on to him. Allison. He's found Radcheck. Lakeview bus depot. Bring him in, Dan. Bring him in, and then what? Not a shred of evidence to connect him with Colton's death. Mm, stay with him long enough, you'll probably win his confidence and get a confession. Thanks, Mr. North. Thirty minutes later, Anton Radchak boarded a bus at the Lakeview terminal.
O'Hara delayed arresting Radchek. He was certain that Radchek had not murdered Colton merely to escape a relatively minor charge of illegal entry into the United States. Using Radchek to point out any contacts he might have, O'Hara and Allison trailed him to San Francisco. As the bus crossed the Big Bay Bridge, Radchak's sense of smug satisfaction increased. His growing sense of security fell in with O'Hara's plan of action, which was to use Radchak as a bird dog to lead them to whatever connections he had in San Francisco. Connections which might explain the reason for Radchak's presence in Lakeview. At the bus terminal, Radchak took a taxi cab and led O'Hara and Allison to a rooming house in an older section of the city. See you later. Right. Aided by the agents of the San Francisco office, O'Hara set up a 24-hour surveillance of Radchak's hideout. A motion picture camera was concealed in constantly changing vehicles, and everyone who entered or left the rooming house was secretly photographed. The only telephone in the house was monitored, and every incoming or outgoing call recorded by an agent whose equipment was set up in a basement of a house on the next street. But Radjack had no visitors and left the house only to take his meals and to buy a newspaper at the corner restaurant. Thank you, sir. Evening papers. Get the evening paper here. Evening paper. something. I'll be right over. Right. At least he supports you and your kids. Oh, mine supports her a half a dozen bookies in O'Leary's saloon down on the corner. Wait till I get my hands on him. That was Mrs. Green. We've been able to identify the voices of everybody in the house, but this is a new one. It identifies itself. Can you trace that call? And uh, dial telephones are tough. How long will it take? The miraculous we do immediately. The impossible takes a few minutes longer. Good boy. At 10.30 the next morning, O'Hara was summoned to Radchak's hideout by a telephone call from Allison. for breakfast at 8 o'clock, right? Yeah. Well, it's past 10.30 now, and he hasn't even shown. That's why I called you. Oh, I see. 
No visitors? Nobody in or out. I gotta find out whether or not he's in that room. Pull a wire, Inspector Gag, and see if he's there. Try that anymore. And make sure you're home in time for yeah, dinner. Yeah, I'll be here. Say, Dan, I think you better come up. What's happened? Take a look. I guess that explains why I didn't get down to breakfast. Right through the heart. Hardly any blood at all. Rigor mortis is complete. Probably been dead for hours. That means he was killed sometime last night. No visitors, eh? Now, well, I was on. Maybe found out we had him boxed up and killed himself. Uh-uh. This Los Angeles paper didn't walk in here by itself. It's three days old. I follow down the corner where Radcheck got his news doesn't sell out of town sheets. That means that the killer brought it with him. He also brought that knife. He really came prepared. I know, but a man with a knife, why didn't Radcheck call out? Well, look at him. Position in the chair. Look at the room. No sign of a struggle. Whoever killed him, he trusted. The way it looks, Mr. Radcheck suddenly became an embarrassment to his friends. It was just a little too hot to handle. I'm going back down to the office and take a look at that film we shot. You stay here and call the police. Right. In the San Francisco office of the FBI, O'Hara called together all of the agents working with him on the Radcheck case. In a projection room, they studied every foot of the film photographed by the hidden camera. That's Mrs. Green. Lived there for five years. As you can see, she loves to talk. That's Mrs. Katz, landlady. That's Albert Green, second floor rear. Mrs. Green's husband. He never gets a chance to talk. Mrs. Harner, first floor front. And the milkman. He used to drop bombs. Now he drops bottles. That's old man Katz, coming home with a snoot full. What's his name? Freeze it. Miller, you shot this last night? That's right. Who is this gentleman? Well, you can see for yourself. He's a clergyman. What time did he go in? 11.48. Father, you were covering the front then. Did you see him? Well, yeah, sure. Whom did he visit? I don't know. He just came in and went upstairs. Uh-huh. How long did he stay? Well, not more than 15 minutes. Came back down at uh, two minutes past 12. Well, we know and have checked everyone that went in or out of that house up to the minute of Rad Jack's murder. He's the only person that we don't know. Therefore, he's your killer. But Dan, a clergyman? Well, anybody can put on a black suit and turn his collar around. Who followed him? Well, who followed him? Well, I guess I was supposed to, Dan, but a clergyman, and I figured that... Oh, great, Potter, great. You figured. Come in. Oh, Dan, did the film give you any line on the rat check killer? Yeah. He got in and out of the house dressed as a clergyman. That's a bad break. Any leads? Only the telephone call the Radcheck made last night. It's a dial phone, you know. It's pretty tough to trace. Yeah. 
I was just about to ask you to come in. I'd like to have your opinion on something else that's come up. Yes, Mr. Hunter? Uh, ask Mr. Grayson to step into my office, please. Yes, sir. Scott and Yard Man. Uh, this might be in line with your assignment at Lakeview. Uh, any luck, Grayson? Not yet, sir. Your handwriting men haven't been able to identify the writing on the shipping label. Oh, I see. Uh, Dan, this is Mr. Philip Grayson, Scotland Yard. Dan O'Hara, special agent. How do you do? How are you? You got a lot of your territory, aren't you? Well, the way things are, it's a little difficult to know where one's territory begins or ends. Uh, how right you are. Mr. Grayson made a special trip from London with these. This is a very nice painting of San Francisco. But what is this? Sir John Gard, our foremost authority on atomic research, says that the mathematical equation is a formula of the most advanced nature. The solution to a problem in nuclear physics. No, thanks. Mr. Grayson was flown over here with the hope that we might identify the source. Uh, would you mind outlining it for him? Of course, sir. Here you are. Thanks. For some months, we've had a very dangerous secret agent under surveillance. Thursday last, he received a crate shipped to him from San Francisco, express. In the normal course, we intercepted it. It contained a painting. That's a photograph of the painting. Mm-hmm. Now, we know our man's not the type to be importing art from America for art's sake. So we sent it to our lab for examination. Under ultraviolet light, this formula, cleverly worked in with the pigments of the painting, became visible. That's a photo of the concealed equation. I sent copies of those last night to the directors of each of our projects in which atomic energy is involved. Beck flew down to Los Angeles to check with Dr. Townsend at the Lakeview Project. Excuse me. this, gentlemen. <clears throat> Mr. Hunter, isn't Lakeview one of your top secrets? Our Lakeview laboratory is nearing the completion of one of our most vital objectives of scientific research. A combination of our most advanced knowledge of the use of guided missiles and atomic force. You know, this Radchek affair is beginning to shape up, Mr. Hunter. Colton was murdered by a suspected subversive in Lakeview. From Mr. Grayson here, we learned that in London, a secret agent received a painting in which was concealed a mathematical formula, which we have now traced to Lakeview. Put those two facts together. What do they suggest? What you've held from the beginning, that Radchek wouldn't commit murder just to escape the relatively minor charge of illegal entry. Exactly. And don't forget Colton's last words. He stumbled on something red hot. Of course, it might be coincidental. I don't think so, sir. Come in. How about it, Gaines? Any luck? Uh, by counting the dial clicks in the record, we trace the call. Well? Well, you're not going to like this, Dan. But Radchek's friend Igor took the call to the public pay station. That's all we needed. Excuse me. Did you say Igor? Yes, Igor. That's interesting. So if you'll take your magnifying glass and look at the photograph of the painting, you'll see the name of the artist who signed it. Igor. Igor Braun. It all ties up, Dan. I think Braun's your man. Sure, sure he's my man. But where do I find him? Where is he? May I make a suggestion, sir? If you could find the spot where the picture was painted, you might find the artist. Mr. Grayson, I'm glad you came over. Thank you. Mr. Hunter, I need six men born and raised in San Francisco, no every nook and corner of the city. You got them. Yes, Mr. Hunter? Send Morgan in here, please. With photographs of the painting as the only clue, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation searched the city for the location shown in the picture painted by Igor Braun. Well, what do you think? That's it, all right. It's painted from the rear of one of those houses on Clay Street. Come on. The point from which the painting had been made was the rear of this building. Igor Braun occupied a studio apartment on the third floor. 
Because of the international involvement, Inspector Grayson was given a special assignment to work with O'Hara on the case. O'Hara set up a complete surveillance of Braun, including an observation post from which his every move could be watched. O'Hara. Hi, Frank. Hi, Dan. Oh, how are things on Observatory Hill? I'm okay, great. fine. Not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah? Sure. Wow. You think he'd get nervous having us look over his shoulder like this? He looks different from his photo. He does? Let me take a look. Oh, sure. Sure he does. Now he's got his collar on right. What you been doing? Just painting. No visitors? Not yet. Any mail? They got a gas bill on the light bill this morning. Keynes checked with us ten minutes ago. No telephone calls in or out. Didn't he go out? He went out to breakfast. Oh, and Dan, uh, this time I went with him. Good boy, Potter. He eats regularly at Wong's. Takes about 20 minutes for lunch, 45 for dinner. He's due to go to lunch any minute now. I'd like to have a look at that new picture he's painting. Mm -hmm. I've been playing around with the same idea. 20 minutes doesn't give us much time. Do you think we could do it without giving ourselves away? Do we have a choice? Oh, Dan. Yeah? He's leaving right now. Okay, Potter, he's yours. Let us know when he gets to the restaurant. Right. Quite good. You know, this brawn could be a pretty fair painter. Yes, if there wasn't so much red in his work. <laughs> That's right. It's a nice sense of perspective. I'll let you give me a lecture on art appreciation sometime when we've got more than 20 minutes to do it in. By now, I think we ought to get busy. Merely a thought in passing. Yes, I see it. Hold this steady. We're going to want to check. The formula on the painting's new, all right. You notice the difference? Yes. Your Lakeview people in for another nasty shock. Ratchik came from Lakeview. Ratchik saw Braun. Exit Ratchik. Braun paints a new formula. Hangs together very well, doesn't it? Not too well. Center, will you please? Yeah. You're stretching 20 minutes awfully thin. Yeah. Having Mr. Braun's fingerprints on file might prove useful someday. Well, he's not attending a banquet, you know. He's just grabbing a bite of lunch. You never have a better chance than this. No good, huh? No. Allison. Check. Uh, 
Here are some beauties. All four fingers are the right hand. Good. Move off a little. I got a picture of them. That's it. On the following day, Grayson and O'Hara watch Braun complete the painting, which he created with great care. An express company truck called at the studio, and Braun took a receipt for the painting from its driver. Grayson followed the truck through the streets of San Francisco to its destination. Established the fact that the painting was consigned to London, England. They decided not to intercept this painting. They reasoned that such an act would be certain to alarm Braun before his contacts at Lakeview could be uncovered. That same afternoon, Igor Braun packed his bags for what seemed an extended journey. He went to the San Francisco airport and boarded a plane for Los Angeles. Flight 136. Without giving an indication of knowledge that he was being shadowed, Braun was met at the Los Angeles airport by a man driving an inconspicuous black sedan which led O'Hara and Grayson straight to Lakeview, California. O'Hara to Johnson, come in, please. Johnson to O'Hara, over. Cover the Lakeview art shop as quickly as possible. Airtight, understand? Right. Braun was received with respectful cordiality by the proprietor of the Lakeview art shop, Juan Adolf Meisner. I trust you had a pleasant trip, comrade. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, fine, fine. Good evening, comrades. Good evening, Good evening. comrade Braun. It's a great honor to have you visit us, comrade Braun. Thank you. We've been gathered to receive you since your phone call. It's good to see my friends again. Please. There's been a slight dislocation in our method of operation, which is responsible for my being here. You refer to comrade Redcheck? Yes. Radchik will not be with us again. Pity. He was guilty of stupidity and clumsiness in carrying out his last assignment. We, who are dedicated to the ideal of world revolution, understand that the individual counts for nothing. We have the complete achievement of our work at Lakeview within our grasp. We cannot permit the slightest risk of jeopardizing our success. For that reason, I have decided to take personal command of the operation. I promise you, the reward will be great. Oh, that's wonderful. Your presence will be an inspiration. Comrade Braun. Yes, Comrade Krebs. About Radchek's misfortune, I took this picture of the FBI man at Colton's uh, liquidation a moment after the police discovered his body. Really? The two gentlemen in civilian clothes the one on the right is taking charge of the investigation. Oh, interesting. Most interesting. Splendid work on your part, Conrad. 
You must always remember, comrades, it's of vital importance to know your enemy. But it's of even greater importance that the enemy does not know you. Radcheck made that mistake. I trust there will be no more. People always cherish Radcheck's memory. And we will not forget this gentleman. With Braun and the art shop under complete surveillance, O'Hara and Grayson next conferred with Dr. Frederick Townsend, director of the Lakeview Nuclear Research Laboratory, the only person connected with the project who knew O'Hara to be an agent of the FBI. Happy to see you again, Mr. O'Hara. Thank you, Dr. Townsend. Doctor, this is Mr. Grayson, Scotland Yard. Mr. Grayson, Doctor. Because of the international ramifications of this matter, Mr. Grayson has been put on special assignment to work with me. Oh. Something on the order of reverse land lease, Doctor. As a matter of fact, Doctor, it was Mr. Grayson here who uncovered the original leak. Well, naturally, what you've discovered comes as a tremendous shock to me. Even in the face of such incontrovertible proof, I can hardly bring myself to believe it. Just how serious is it, Doctor, from the standpoint of your work? It's more than serious, Mr. Grayson. It's almost fatal. We are coming very near to the completion of our project. And this formula, which found its way outside this plant, represents a vital stage in the structure of our research. Well, I, I hate to add to your distress, Doctor, but since that time, another formula has found its way into wrong hands. Until a week ago, this formula had not been conceived. Whoever is guilty has a rapid and direct line of communication. Well, it establishes, gentlemen, that up to this minute, the ultimate recipient of this stolen information knows as much about our work as, as I do. I'm afraid that's the only conclusion, Doctor. That's a monstrous thought. That one of the few of us in this laboratory who share such knowledge is a traitor. I understand the urgency of your task, gentlemen. Where would you like to begin? Well, for my own satisfaction, and because Mr. Grayson is unfamiliar with it, I'd like to recheck the physical security procedure. Very well. This way, please. O'Hara and Grayson searched for a flaw in the security regulations as they toured the plant with Dr. Townsend. The guards were specially chosen men, each of them an ex-soldier, sailor or marine, who had proven his loyalty and love of country in battle. The workers disrobed in a special guarded locker room and then stripped of the hide, passed into a second locker room, in which they donned standardized working clothes before being permitted to proceed to their posts. This routine was mandatory for every worker entering or leaving the plant. As an additional safeguard, it was necessary to submit to the search of this electronic eye, which could detect the presence of the most minute particle of metal upon the person of anyone passing before it. Well, there you are. You've seen it all. What do you think? Armed guards, barbed wire, electronics. Seems pretty tight. Evidently not tight enough. As I understand it, the creative brains here are your colleagues Allen, Von Staub, Forrest, and of course yourself. With Dr. Neva acting in the capacity of a confidential assistant and sort of a recording secretary. That's correct. Do all of you know about everything? I mean, do you do your thinking together, or is it every man for himself? Well, each of us works on a different phase of the problem, independent of the others. Then once a week, uh, usually on Friday, we hold a conference at which we pool all the developments of the week, uh, our progress is evaluated, and uh, everyone's brought up to date. I see. Then every Friday, for the moment anyway, everybody does know everything. Exactly. Where do you hold your conferences, Doctor? Right here in this room. Pardon me. As you can see, this also contains the special vault where all our data is kept. Mm -hmm. Does Dr. Neva take part in these conferences? Oh, certainly, the most important part. She takes notes of everything. Dr. Neva is practically the hub around which our wheel revolves. She's a most remarkable girl. Oh, she must be to hold such an important position. Is this the door that leads to your private study, Doctor? Yes. Is it ever used during the conferences? No, that's always kept locked. I uh, have the only key to that. I see. One more question, sir. 
Are you and your associate scientists permitted to leave the premises? But Lakeview is not a penitentiary, Mr. Grayson. We're perfectly free to come and go as we wish, governed by the same security regulations that apply to everyone who works on the project. Well, thank you, sir. Yes, thanks very much, Doctor. We won't take any more of your time now. You've been most cooperative. It's been a pleasure. With the cooperation of Dr. Townsend, the mirror in the study door was secretly replaced with a special type of glass through which they could observe and photograph every move made at the Friday conference, but which could not be seen through from the conference room side. For the first time, Grayson and O'Hara could observe the key figures of the Lakeview project in action. First, there was Dr. Ritter von Stolb of Viennese, formerly professor of nuclear physics at Heidelberg and an internationally famous mathematician. After the Allied victory in Europe, Dr. von Stolb was persuaded to come to the United States to give our government the benefit of his knowledge. Second, there was Dr. Homer Allen, physicist and expert on rocket propulsion, an American whose lineage could be traced back to the original settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Then there was Dr. William Forrest, English scientist, whose experiments with heavy water contributed greatly to the final achievement of atomic fission. He was on leave from the British Atomic Commission to the Lakeview Project. Last, but far from least, there was Dr. Anastasia Neva, Tony for short, Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Michigan, mistress of five languages, including Russian, and Townsend's secretary and confidential assistant. In addition to being photographed, a wire recorder preserved every word uttered within the room. Now, Doctor, the point that still baffles us is the ratio of energy to be released in offsetting the dynamic deceleration of the carrier vehicle. Yes, I know. Von Stolp has been working on that. If there is a solution to the problem, it's, uh, it's purely mathematical. Theoretical, rather. Almost fantasy. My dear Alan, mathematics is a pure science which doesn't permit fantasy. Only fact. Eventually, all theory must be submitted to the proof of the law of numbers, which uh, I'm happy to say has established our theory to be factual. Here. This is amazing. This is certainly the answer to our problem. Well, mathematics may be completely factual, as you say, but in your case, it's certainly blessed with a tremendous imagination. In the beginning, Einstein's entire thesis was imagination. I'm so proud of you, Ritter. Thank you, darling. Well, isn't our doubting Thomas convinced? I'm stole, but I don't quite understand the application of your second equation. Oh, I do. It's beautifully established. I may be mistaken, but it strikes me as being a minus factor. You have missed the inclusion of the element N3 in the reconstruction of the nuclear pattern. Oh, yes. <laughs> I should have known you couldn't be guilty of error. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> Again, our mathematical Babe Ruth hits a home run with the bases full. Now, uh, that's what I would like to do, to play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, our game is nearly over. One more inning like this, and I think we shall have won it. You care to have dinner with me tonight in a game of chess, Ritter? I think I uh, have an engagement for dinner. No, thanks very much. He has an engagement uh, with uh, guess who? You'll take care of the notes, don't you? Oh, yes, of course, Doctor. All right, that's enough, Dawson. Well, there we saw it. Genius at work. Mm -hmm. Notice anything out of the ordinary? No, except the little scene between von Stolb and Dr. Neva. And the fact that she was the last person to handle the paper on which he wrote his equation. If that's out of the ordinary. And yet it's right after these conferences that that information has slipped to Braun. Close examination of the film failed to provide a lead to the manner in which information was being spirited out of Lakeview. But deduction convinced both O'Hara and Grayson that the time immediately following the Friday conferences was the hot spot. Acting on this reasoning, O'Hara took immediate steps to have all of the key figures of the Lakeview project shadowed. 
All right, Malone. Okay, Dan, I've got him. driving them. Thompson makes a pretty good cab driver, doesn't he? Excellent. Harlow speaking. Professional men's club in Glendale. Oh. He made a speech and went back to the plant. Okay, Malone, go to bed. No luck, huh? Nope. Townsend made a speech at the professional club in Glendale. Von Stowe. What a place to take your girl. Hollywood Bowl. Wagner. Tristan and Isolde. You couldn't say it wasn't romantic. And you couldn't say Von Stowe when Dr. Neva went in the mood. Hello? Aaron? Yes, this is Dan. We ate dinner at the prime rib. Mm-hmm. Doc Sinus went back to the plant. All right, Thompson, call it a day. Forrest and Allen had dinner alone at the prime rib. Talk science, then went back to the plant, period. You snore, Scotty? Mm. All Englishmen snore. If I should tap you lightly on the head during the night with an ashtray, you'll know what I mean. Oh, boy, am I tired. Nice people are scientific suspects. Very nice. Very congenial. Except one or more is a traitor and an accessory before the fact of two murders. Care to hazard a guess, Mr. Grayson? That's the rob chum. You pay your money, you take your choice. I'll take Tony. Yeah, she is rather attractive. Von Staub does all right for a scientist. Romance among the research. Well, I suppose it can happen, even in such sterilized environment. Yes, but what does it prove? It seems to prove that Von Staub mixes a few red corpuscles with his protons and neutrons. So what? She had my red corpuscles playing leapfrog, too. Your red corpuscles are probably in a constant state of agitation. Is that bad? You know, if a man like Townsend can be a traitor to his country, I'm ready to resign from the human race. Yes, I feel the same about Forrest. How about Allen? Pioneer American stock, Union League Club, Boston Back Bay. Oh, fine. We're practically proving what has happened couldn't possibly have happened. We've eliminated ourselves completely out of suspects. You know what I think? Huh? I think I need a good night's sleep. Tackle this thing with a fresh mind in the morning. Good night. Good night. O'Hara. Mm -hmm. By your red corpuscles are bouncing in pursuit of the dream image of the fair Tony. It might be well to add these few random thoughts of her to your dreams. Why don't you go to sleep? 
Item, she is Townsend's confidential secretary and is completely informed on all phases of the Lakeview project. Item, only she, besides Townsend, knows the combination to the vault. Item, she speaks five languages, including Russian. Interesting, isn't it? Well, good night. Wait a minute. Miss, what did you mean about Tony? Hmm? Well, that's what I keep asking myself. Just what do I mean? Oh, well, we'll approach it with a fresh mind in the morning. Good night. On the Monday following the Friday conference of Lakeview scientists, Igor Braun expressed another crate addressed to London, England. Acting under special authority, Grayson and O'Hara boarded the train, opened the crate, and established that it contained another painting by Braun. Later the same night, the painting was examined in the laboratory of the Los Angeles office of the FBI. I hope Dr. Townsend hasn't a weak heart. This is going to be an even greater shock to him. And we'll have to let it go through. To hold it any length of time is almost certain to arouse Braun's suspicions. That's right. We mustn't do that until we know how he gets the data out of the plant and who's supplying him with it. I'd be willing to take the stand and swear that nothing can get out of that project but the laundry. What was that again? I said nothing can get out of there but the laundry. You're so right. Here it is. Report on local people who visited Braun. The first name on the list is Carl Benish, night manager of the Elite Laundry. You see that? Yeah. Sure. The Elite Laundry. Friday night after the conference, Tony and Von Staub. Quiet. Looks like I'm about to get a new job in the laundry. I think it's a job for Grayson, if he'll take it on. It will do away with even the slightest risk of having you or one of our other agents recognized by anybody in the laundry. How about it? Of course I'll take it on. Good. The Federal Bureau of Investigation arranged to have Grayson planted in the elite laundry, where on the following Friday night at 8 o'clock, Because of the fact that the Lakeview project was within one step of completion, it had been decided that no more of the secret data could be permitted to fall into the hands of Igor Braun. Hence, O'Hara was forced to take direct action.
isolate the prince, will you? All right. That's strange, a lady's handkerchief and a bundle of men's clothes. You don't know just how strange it is. Yeah, hand-stitched, hand-embroidered, Irish linen, never been laundered. Fred, take a look at this for writing, will you? Okay. Let's see what it shows under heat. Ammonia fumes. Well, go ahead. Think. It doesn't look like it's going to work. Well, you boys better come up with something or I'm a dead duck. We'll go to chemicals. It may take some time. I'll wait. Comrade Meisner. Yes, Comrade Bro. Where is Krebs? I don't know. He's never been this late. Find out if he's left the laundry. Yes, immediately. Maybe it's a silver salt solution. Well, let's try for it. She blows. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Well, we've got it. How was it done? Well, the draftsman's round pointed pen, using a solution containing silver salt. It's the same stuff that's used in emulsion of photographic film. Then to bring it out, you treat it with a developer. That turns the silver salts black. Yes, it all checks. Oh, thanks, fellas. Thanks a lot. Oh, Fred, will you bake that out on your cook stove and shoot it down in my office? Okay, Dan. So, someone took the package of laundry away from you, Comrade Krebs. Yes. In the alley, in the dark. I had no chance. You realize what you're saying? I... I'm trying to explain how it was. And will you also explain how, at the very moment of our success, you brought us to the brink of disaster? You are guilty of worse stupidity and greater negligence than the late comrade Ratchet. Oh, but comrade, I... The man who took the bundle knew its contents. He must have followed you from the laundry. Who was that man? I don't know, comrade. I don't know. I didn't have a chance to see. Comrade Braun. Yeah? There's a man at the laundry, a new man. What new man? He came to work Tuesday on the night shift. What about him? Well, it's nothing you can pick out, but he doesn't seem like the other laundry floaters that take jobs like this. I see. And you waited until now to tell me about this new man? Well, I wasn't sure. No, you weren't. But we'll make sure. Grayson had taken a cheap room in the poorer and almost deserted section of town as being more in keeping with his role of laundry worker. Mutual 72419, Los Angeles, please. Deposit 20 cents for five minutes, please. Federal Bureau 
Bureau's investigation. Mr. Dan O'Hara, please. I'll try to locate him for you. O'Hara. Oh, Mr. O'Hara, I'm glad I caught you. I have a call for you from Lakeview. Thank you. Pardon my curiosity, Mr. O'Hara, but I'd like to keep myself posted on things. How about the laundry? Scotty, I think we've hit the jackpot. The answer to the winner-take-all question. I'm on my way out to Lakeview now with the evidence to talk to Dr. Townsend. Where are you? Oh, I... I'm at home. I'll pick you up on my way out. Be there in about two, 25 minutes. Right. Uh, be careful of the front steps. They're very tired. Snap it! Walked right into it, eh? Sure, I knew he would. Haven't you and Feodor stay outside? Right. Keep out of sight. Look, my friend. Nobody in the house but you and the landlady here. So don't worry about being disturbed. Now, just who are you? Do you always introduce yourself to strangers like this? Your name is Grayson, isn't it? I'm sorry you have the advantage of me. Look at his hands. It's like I said, he never did a day's work before in his life. I wouldn't say that. Maybe you think we're playing games. I wouldn't say that either. See if he has anything on him. Why'd you go to work for the laundry? My appetite. You sound like you're British. What are you doing in Lakeview? I came here for my help. Pay attention. Have you ever seen this man before? No. You're lying. Maybe you're an FBI man, too. I'm not. You were planted in that laundry for a reason. What was it? I don't know what you're talking about. You saw me pick up a bundle of laundry tonight. Tipped off your G-man partner. What did he want with that bundle? Where did he take it? I still don't know what you're talking about. You get rough, fella. Wait a minute. Maybe we can find out another way. Look, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The answers better be right. How long have you known this man? Came to live here a week ago. Has anyone come to visit him since he's been here? Nobody. I'll keep on refreshing your memory like that. Now. Who did he talk to on the telephone? Who called him? I don't know. Have you ever seen this man around here? No. You're lying. He did come here. He came to see him. No. Come on, you can do better than that. You're stalling. You're stalling. Relax. Don't worry about me, young man. I see plenty of fellows like these before I escape to this country. This is not the first time I've been asked questions in the same way by gentlemen like him. My whole family was questioned to death. I'm the only one left to answer more questions.
You don't have to knock. Go right in. Well, O'Hara. What a pleasant surprise. Just part of what I owe you for that business in the alley. Pretty smart, aren't you? So you found the answer. Thank you for delivering it to me in person. So this is the man you said you didn't know. You didn't know him either. He never came here. All right, Curly. Give us ten minutes. And you and Feodor remove these gentlemen. I see. When you can't convince, you kill, eh? We have a nicer word for it. Liquidation. You know what to do. Sure. Just make sure they have no identification on them. All right, Benish. Well, goodbye, gentlemen. All right. On your feet. You too. Come on, get going. Stand over against the wall. Put your hands over your heads. Big boy, turn around. Slip off your coat. I'll get those cleaners tags. I haven't had it that long. Brand new. Too bad you won't be able to wear it longer. And no funny business when you throw it. A watch. Yours, too. I'll take that pen and pencil set, too. <laughs> Says you are good men. And I know from what those others said what they are fighting for. I'll call an ambulance. No, because I will not be here when it comes. I am happy I can do such a small thing for my country. Country that has done so much for me. Immediately after seeing their two prisoners jailed, O'Hara and Grayson raided the Lakeview art shop. Boys, you got the back door covered. Good. You fellows cover the alley. We'll take the front. Okay. The capture of Braun and Krebs and the recovery of the handkerchief containing a copy of the secret formula was now of paramount importance. Show himself to the men we had watching. I didn't think he'd be foolish enough to stay here and greet us. I wonder where he's going to wait for the final formula. That I don't know. But I do know he's not going to get it. Dr. von Stolb and Tony guilty. That's incredible. It's fantastic. How far does your work progressed at this moment? Dr. von Stolb provided us with the final formula last night. Was either uh, Tony or Von Stobe left the project since that time? No, none of us. Good morning. Good morning. You sent for me, Dr. Townsend? Yes. This is Mr. O'Hara, Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
is Mr. Grayson, Scotland Yard. How do you do? How do you do? They'd like to talk to you uh, privately. Privately? Is anything wrong? Yes, I'm afraid there is. Would you step into the study, please? Oh, yes. Yes, certainly. The doctor, I'd like to know the minute Von Staub comes in, please. Of course. Would you sit down? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Grayson, I don't understand. Do you understand the penalty for treason, Dr. Neva? Treason? What is the purpose of this interview? What do you mean by treason? It would be much better if you cooperated with us, Dr. Neva. We know the secret information has been sent out of this plant to foreign agents. Oh, no, it couldn't have. But it has. Each Friday after the conferences, von Staub's calculations have been copied in a solution of silver salts on one of your handkerchiefs. Oh, that's impossible. Later on the same evening, you've delivered that handkerchief to the elite laundry, concealed among your other personal effects. How long have you known this man, Braun? Braun? I don't know anyone by that name. Oh, come now, doctor. Surely you remember the name of the man for whom this information was intended. I've had enough of this. I won't be browbeaten. I don't know what your motive is, but I refuse to be treated like a criminal. How dare you insinuate that a handkerchief of mine could be connected with theft or treason? I'm not insinuating, Dr. Neva. I'm stating a fact. Mr. O'Hara, what you're trying to prove is absurd. Let me remind you that I am not a mathematician and I do not understand the formulas. To copy them, you wouldn't have to understand them. If you have such a handkerchief, produce it. Prove that the handwriting is mine. I can do better than that, Doctor. We've never thought that you were in this alone. I'll prove that you have an accomplice here in the project who furnished you with copies of the formulas and helped you deliver them. An accomplice? The man who created those formulas. If you're referring to Ritter von Stolbe, you're insane. After all he's contributed here, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous to accuse him of betraying a country he's, he's come to love. Dr. Neva. Wait a minute, O'Hara. We must give Dr. Neva a chance to collect her thoughts. After all, we're dealing with an intelligent, highly sensitive woman who quite naturally is emotionally upset. I've seen Dr. Von Stolbe. I, uh, I think he's charming. Oh, if you only knew him. I can understand how he'd attract any woman, especially if he wanted to use her love to make a dupe of her. I don't think I understand you. Oh, but I understand you. You love him very much, don't you? Yes, I do love him very much. You understand, I want to be lenient. And I'm sure Mr. O'Hara would make a strong recommendation for clemency. Wouldn't you, Mr. O'Hara? I might, in return for full cooperation. There, you see, practically a promise. What a fool I am. I thought for a moment you believed me. You're very clever, Mr. Grayson. It's a pity I haven't a confession to make, even to you. Your performance deserves one. You didn't have to force me to admit that I love Dr. Von Stolbe. I do. So make the most of it. But I deny everything, every contemptible thing you've said or implied. And that's all I have to say. Nice try. Didn't do much good, though. Did Dr. Neva... For the time being, we're going to confine her to her quarters. I'll assign a man to see that she doesn't leave the project. She confessed? What about Von Stolp? He hasn't reported to his office yet and doesn't answer his bungalow phone. We were all up a little bit late last night. Perhaps we'd better run over there, Doctor. I'll show you to his quarters. Thank you. I can't believe a man like Von Stolp would do a thing like this. I would have staked my life on his loyalty and integrity. He must have discovered that you were going to question Tony. His suicide is practically a confession. I guess you could interpret it that way. Well, it was a terrible thing to say, but if this puts an end to this whole ghastly affair... You know, if he had any visitors last night? Yes, I know he did. Well, who was here, to your knowledge, Doctor? Well, the conference lasted till about 11. I walked home here with Von Staub. Tony dropped in after finishing her work. About 12.30, Forrest came in and Alan, we were all here. And shortly after that, uh, Tony and I left. Leaving Alan and Forrest alone with him? Yes. How was he dressed when you last saw him? In well, his regular clothes. Not in his pajamas? No. I suppose you leave us to take care of the details, Doctor. Uh, yes, of course.
Looks like a perfect suicide setup, doesn't it? Perfect. Guilty man lacks courage to face arrest. Of course, that substantiates our case against von Stove and Tony right to the hilt. Certainly appears that way. Here's the glass used for the poison. That stuff is dynamite. Kills in a matter of seconds. Paralyzes the entire nervous system the instant it hits the throat. Say, hmm? can you imagine him drinking that here and then walking into there? That's a good question. Come here a minute. I see it. His glass couldn't have made that large a mark. There were two glasses here. Looks like our friend Von Stove had a late visitor. He couldn't have had his last drink and then removed the other glass from the table. And then walked into the bedroom. He was carried, of course. It's murder. It's got to be murder. Killer came back after the others had left. Von Stove got out of bed, went to the door and let him in, which means it was somebody that he knew very well. Exactly. And murder blows our whole case right out the window. Oh, what a mess I've made of this. I should get out of the office and tell Mr. North to take me off the assignment. We're uncovered to the other side anyway, right out in the open. Oh, wait a minute. Braun has a problem, too. By having Dr. Neva in custody, we've cut his line of communication with the Lakeview Project. Yes, if it is Dr. Neva. But if it isn't Dr. Neva, Braun might be forced to have his collaborator inside the project bring that final formula out to him. What else can he do? You think he'd take such a chance to risk of exposing the connection he has in the plan? He has to. He must have the final formula to make the information he already has of any value. The person we want inside the plant will lead us to the man we want outside. I'd like to have another look at the film we made of the conference, wouldn't you? Yes, yes, I would. Mathematics is a pure science which doesn't permit fantasy, only fact. Eventually, all theory must be submitted to the proof of the law of numbers. Let's keep our eyes on that paper in von Stove's hand. All right. Which, I'm happy to say, has established our theory to be factual. Here. This is amazing. This is certainly the answer to our problem. Well, mathematics may be completely factual, as you say, but in your case, it's certainly blessed with a tremendous imagination. In the beginning, Einstein's entire thesis was imagination. I'm so proud of you, Ritter. Thank you, darling. Well, isn't our doubting Thomas convinced? I'm Stolb, I don't quite understand the application of your second equation. Oh, I do. It's beautifully established. I may be mistaken, but it strikes me as being a minus factor. You have missed the inclusion of the element N3 in the reconstruction of the nuclear pattern. Oh, yes. I should have known you couldn't be guilty of error. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> Again, our mathematical Babe Ruth hits a home run with the bases full. You'll take care of the notes, Tony. Oh, yes, of course, Doctor. Well? I still can't figure it out. Neither can I. And the paper was always in plain sight. Except when Alan leaned across the table to check von Stolbe's results. Yes, but you could see it all the time. And it stayed on that table until Tony took charge of it after the conference. Yet a copy of the formula was delivered to Braun that same night. Continuing to hold Tony in custody, O'Hara, in cooperation with the local authorities, maintained a death watch over Townsend, Allen, and Forrest who shared between them the final step in the successful completion of the Lakeview project. Both Grayson and O'Hara knew that there was no longer any doubt. One of those three men was the traitor and the murderer of Von Stoll. O'Hara to Billings, come in please. Billings, over. California, 17U982, don't lose it. Check. You sure you won't take in that lecture with me? No, thanks. Not tonight. All right. See you in the morning. Good night. Good night.
Harry to Grayson, come in. Grayson to O'Hara, over. California 29J422. Right. Grayson. O'Hara calling Grayson. Come in, please. Grayson to O'Hara. What is it? Drop whatever you're doing and get right over here. I'm on Lakeview Boulevard, heading north towards Sepulveda Junction. Looks like I drew the lucky number. We found our man. And Scotty, I know now how this thing has been done. I just found out what it was we missed in the projection room. Good boy. I'll be with you in a few minutes. And don't spare the horses. I'll fix your ticket. O'Hara to all units. Prepared all units in the Los Angeles police in this area. Emergency order. Converge on Lakeview Boulevard near Sepulveda Junction and await further orders. Come in. Grayson to O'Hara, come in, please. Grayson to O'Hara, come in, please. In. What happened? Let's get out of here. I'll tell you later. O'Hara to all units. O'Hara to all units. Locate and follow California license 9P5017. I repeat, 9P5017. This car is escorted by a black sedan headed towards the moment of junction. Approach with caution. Do not apprehend or alarm these drivers. Allow them to reach their destination and report back to me. Car 
119 to O'Hara. Come in, please. O'Hara to car 119. Over. Car 19-5017. Trace to location. Location is isolated house three miles north of Sepulveda Junction. Nearest intersection is Saugus Road. Instructions, please. Over. O'Hara to car 119. Keep location covered and permit no one to leave premises. O'Hara off. O'Hara, the car you once parked outside the house. It was tailed in by that other car. One man from the first car went into the house, two from the other. Are they still in there? They're still there, sir. No one came out. Good. Have your men get ready to move in, Sergeant. Don't fire unless I give the signal. Right. It's Braun, isn't it? Yeah, it looks like him. That's the last we saw of him. You've done well, Comrade Krebs. You too, Alan. In a few days, we shall be honored as none of our comrades has ever been honored before. We shall be able to ask anything. Anything. Braun! Braun! This is your last chance to surrender. Got this house surrounded. Throw your guns out the windows and come out with your hands up. We, we haven't got a chance. Get some ammunition. Nice shooting, Scotty. Thanks. Well, that takes care of Braun and his boys. Where's the one we really want? Come in. How long will it take? Just a few seconds. Now look, Dr. Allen. But I tell you, I was not there of my own free will. Yes, I know. You've told us that a dozen times. At 6.30 this evening, I received an urgent telephone call asking me to come to that house on a matter of grave importance. When I arrived at the door, I was seized by those men without so much as an explanation. Oh, I see. Practically kidnapped, eh? Why, yes. What could they have wanted from me? I have no money. We know what your friend Braun wanted. The final data on the Lakeview project. Are you insinuating... Sit down, Dr. Allen. Just keep your seat until we can put you in a much hotter one. This is preposterous. I am a man of standing. I have an unblemished personal and professional reputation. Mr. North, may I inquire on what idiotic charge I am being held? Treason. Conspiracy against the people of the United States. And murder. 
Von Staub? You must have been under tremendous pressure, Doctor. You weren't too clever with that affair. Can't you add a few more? Have you any idea what fools you're making of yourselves? Oh, Dan, all set. I demand proof of these absurd charges. I think I can satisfy even you, Doctor. May I see your hand? I refuse to submit to these Gestapo practices. Aren't you going to call us fascist black shirts too, Doctor? Isn't that part of the usual routine? I have influential friends in Washington. Your hand. I'll see that you sweat for this outrage. Your hand, please, Doctor. This is what we missed in the film of the conference at Lakeview, Mr. North. When this gentleman leaned across the table and pressed his hand on von Stove's formula, his palm had previously been treated with a chemical. Later, he developed the chemical, just as we did now. Then he made a copy of the formula on a handkerchief he stole from Dr. Neva's bungalow, which he later put back into a laundry hamper. Tonight, he didn't have that opportunity. He was forced to carry the information out to Braun himself. Would you like to call your friends in Washington now, Doctor, and complain about the Gestapo? I wish to be represented by counsel. I demand the protection of due process of law. And the country you try to betray will see that you get it. I know my constitutional rights. You'll never convict me of anything. I'm no foreigner. I'm American. Yes, I know you are, Alan. We once had another American like you. His name was Benedict Arnold. All right, Warren. Come on. It's the end of Alan. Dr. Niebuhr, I, uh, I want you to know how sorry we are. Thank you, Mr. Grayson. Sometimes in the line of duty, one is obliged to... I understand. Thank you for saving what Ritter von Stobe gave his life to create. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, sir. Good luck. Goodbye. Goodbye. I suppose now you'll be going home to England. Not a chance. If they want him, they'll have to bring Scott in the yard over here. You're quite. Can't disrupt the good neighbor policy, you know. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Sure. Goodbye. So international cooperation between two freedom-loving peoples wrote a successful end to our Lakeview case history, which should bring us an added sense of well-being and knowing that the footsteps of those who walk the crooked miles are followed by such men as Grayson and O'Hara. <laughs>